Hey, it's awesome to be with you again and to bring the Word of God to you. And we're going to worship God and exalt Jesus. I'm super excited about that today. Here in a few moments, we're going to start, as, as always, by singing a song and just worshiping God through uh, just praising Him with our voices and just lifting Him up and exalting Him that way. So I'm going to lead us into a word of prayer, and then we're going to jump in uh, to uh, doing that, praising Him through music, and then we're going to spend some time uh, looking at the Word. We're in a series called Comfortable Lies, and we're exposing those, those subtle lies that Satan deceives us with. And we're looking at those and we're being challenged by them. I don't know about you, but I'm being very much challenged by them because as always, when we look to the scripture, it goes much deeper, right? It really cuts to the core uh, as, 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 the, as the scripture teaches. And so I pray that you will just have a humble, sensitive heart and that you will lean in and that we will, we will just exalt the person of Jesus. Would you do that? Let me lead us into a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for uh, giving us this opportunity to worship together and to exalt you. May all that we do and say bring you glory. May all that we do and say lift you up and exalt you because your word tells us that when we lift you up, that when we exalt you, that you're the one that draws all men and women to you. So I pray that that's exactly what would happen today. But first and foremost, I pray that we would just bring you glory, that you would find incredible joy in your children coming together online, in person, however, to just lift you up and sing our praises and, and lean into the message and worship you. And we pray all this in your name. Amen.
His favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May His favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May His favor. Be upon you and a thousand generations, and your family, and your children, and their children, and their children. May His favor be upon you and a thousand generations, and your family, and your children, and their children, and their children. May His praise. If you would, uh, turn with me to Matthew chapter 19. We're going to take a look at a story that uh, is probably very familiar to uh, a lot of you. Uh, and we're going to take a look at yet another, what we are calling, comfortable lie. Okay? So we're in this series called Comfortable, comfortable Lies. And what we're trying to do is just kind of expose some of the ways that Satan can be very deceitful to us. Some of the things that we can buy into uh, and some of the things that are presented to us in a very subtle way. They're not blatant. Uh, and some of them, uh, they can have, again, a little bit of truth in, into them, but they're, but they're intertwined, right? They're intertwined with lies. And what happens is it becomes very counterfeit. And sometimes we end up believing these things and they are not, they're not true. And what we, think, uh, what we think they're going to produce, they certainly don't produce. Though, if you remember, one of the first things, first things we talked about was that God, wants us to make it, that God wants us to be happy at all times. And we talked through that and we realized that you know, if we truly believe that, then we make God out to be someone who is there to serve us. Okay? The second one we talked about was that um, uh, God won't give us more than we can handle or more than we can bear. And we talked about that, and we talked about how that that's not what that verse says. But in Corinthians, it talks about it talks about um, uh, that that it's temptation 
that God won't give us more temptation than we can bear. And we talked about how the temptations that you and I face from time to time, those temptations are not uncommon to anybody else, that uh, they're not unique by, any, by in any way, shape, or form, but uh, that, that all people have experienced them from one time or the other, right? But... But that's not what that verse says. That verse says that God won't give us more than we can come out from underneath of, that we'll never be tempted to the point to where we don't have any way out from underneath of it. But again, I get that God's not going to give us more than we can bear, but we've got to be very careful at times because that is not what that verse says. That verse talks about temptation, okay? And that God will always give us a way out. And so we've been exposing these uh, comfortable lies that we buy into. And today we're going to talk about yet another lie, okay? Today we're going to talk about a lie that's very subtle, and that lie says this, God helps those who help themselves. Okay, now again, that's, a, that's one of these things where we look at it and we say, whoa, 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 wait a second. You know, it does, you know, it talks about the Bible, you know, in the Proverbs, it talks about we need to work and not be lazy and things like that. Yes, I understand that. But I want you to lean into this because, again, this is a very subtle lie that we can buy into. The subtle lie says that God helps those who help themselves. Now, if you think about it, it's a lie because it really communicates self-sufficiency is what it communicates. It communicates self-sufficiency. Self it communicates that, you know what, there's things in, in my life that if I just apply myself, if I just work hard enough, that I can make things happen. And guys, I'm telling you, this is a very dangerous path to start down, okay? This is a very dangerous path to start down because we can become convinced, we can become convinced and deceived and, and buy into this lie that says that we can do some things that we just can't do, i.e. salvation grace, things like that. There is nothing that you can do for your salvation. If you want to say, well, I do, there is one thing that I can do is respond. Now we're just kind of being argumentative, right? Now we're just trying to debate. The point is that God does help us because there are times that we cannot do anything about it. When it comes to salvation, when it comes to living a life that, that is pleasing to God, if we think that we can do it on our own, we are sadly mistaken and we're on a journey that will never produce what we think it can produce, which is, a, 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 is life, okay? And last week we talked about that as well. We talked a little bit about that, you know, this very concept, but I want to explore this just a little bit more, okay? So in Matthew chapter 19, we read about an interaction that Jesus had with a, with a person, and if you want to turn there with me, it's, it, and it really talks about this concept of being self-sufficient. And the nature of the question that's even asked is very disturbing, okay? So if you would, turn with me to chapter 19 of Matthew, and we're going to start with verse 16, and let's read that, okay? So follow along with me. It says this, Just then someone came up and asked him, Teacher, what must I do to have eternal life. Now, we could stop right there and I, we can dispel this lie right out of the gate because it's talking about self-sufficiency. This guy is coming to Jesus and he's asking this question. Teacher, what good must I do to have eternal life? Now, the last time I checked, to have eternal life is through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which we're going to talk about that here in a few moments. But when someone's asking this question, what good must I do to have eternal life? We're already embarking on the wrong journey, okay? He goes on, uh, Jesus says this, and it's very interesting. Why do you ask me about what is good? He said to him, there is only one who is good. If you want, if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Verse 18, which ones, he asked him. Jesus answered, Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now I want you to listen to his response. I have kept all of these. I've done all of these. Okay? I've kept all of these, the young man told him. What do I still lack? And this is a very profound question. <laughs> Because Jesus is going to unload. In verse 21, he says this, If you want to be perfect, Jesus said to him, Go sell your belongings 
and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Verse 22, when the young man heard that command, he went away grieving because he had many possessions. Now, when we look at this passage of Scripture, there's a couple of things I want to share with you. Let's take a look at this guy that approached him, okay? The Bible tells us that he was very rich, okay? And it was rich in earthly terms, uh, rich in earthly possessions, in money, in, uh, you know, again, earthly possessions and things like that. So he was very rich. He was wealthy. He had money. He was very young. Uh, he was probably, and I hate to say this because I've surpassed this age, but studies uh, show, theologians have said that he's probably he's probably no older than 40 he's probably younger than that but he's no older than 40 okay unfortunately I've surpassed that and probably many of you have surpassed that too uh, and so we would not be considered the young the young person right uh, in fact I think it's very and I digress but I think it's very disturbing when we start checking off these boxes where it asks our age and our have you ever noticed how your age group goes to the next category you know, and it's just like, oh, man, I think, I, I think it's really cool when your age group is still in a big chunk of a young age, you know, like 30 to 55. And I can say, yes, I still fall in that. I still fall in that age group. Right. So this guy was young. He was probably he was no older than 40, more than more than likely. Uh, he was very prominent. He was a ruler, right? So that would have indicated that he was prominent. He was probably an official of the synagogue. He had uh, probably some of those responsibilities uh, just by the nature of who he was. Now think about it, just from the nature of who he was. He, he was excellent when it came to the outward appearance. He was excellent when it came to the outward appearance or the, you know, the, outward, the outward heart, the outward mind, right? But something was very telling of this. Just by him coming to Jesus, just by him approaching Jesus with these questions, it indicated that he had some unrest. It indicated that there was something that was missing in his life. Can you hear the self-sufficiency kind of ooze out of him? What must I do? What must you know take place here? What can I accomplish? I've accomplished all these other things. I've got money. I've got wealth. I've got possessions. I've got materialism. You know, I've got materials uh, that you know that I'm that I'm secure in. I'm um, I've got a pretty decent job. I'm a ruler. Okay, I'm prominent. I've ac I've accomplished those things. I've accomplished those things, but I'm missing a couple things here. I'm missing something. I still have this unrest. I still have this disharmony taking place. And so the very, the very nature of his questions uh, to Jesus and coming to Jesus demonstrates that he's got this unrest and this sense of disharmony, okay? He realized he didn't have one thing, and that was eternal life. And so he comes to Jesus asking about eternal life. You know, another way we can say that is, how do, I, you know, how do I obtain everlasting life? How do I obtain salvation? In our terms, in our, the parlance of our times, how must I be saved? How must I be able to enter into heaven, right? Now, I want you to think about this. Go back to the very nature of his question, okay? And it bleeds through his, this whole discourse with Jesus. And it's very narcissistic, okay? Let's not, for, let's not as, let this escape us. Because this is, this is, again, these questions are rooted in self-sufficiency. I, what must I do? What can I accomplish? What can I achieve? What is it that I can accomplish to what? To inherit eternal life. What can I do to be saved? What can I do to have everlasting life? Guys, I want to share something with you and I want you to really lean into this. He's coming to Jesus and he's asking this question, but by the very nature of how he's asking it, of how he can accomplish it, would have been very offensive to Jesus. Okay, think about it. It would have been very offensive to Jesus. Okay, think about it. Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross. He knows that he's going to the cross. He knows that that's the will of, will of the Father. To the point he's, he's already thinking about it. He's, he already knows the implications of it. Jesus is going to be separated from the Father, uh, not just from a physical perspective, but from literally from kind of a spiritual perspective in a sense. And he's aware of this. This is already in his mind. Jesus is getting ready to, uh, as he would call it, drink the cup. He is going to perform the greatest sacrifice of all. He's going to lay his life down so that others may what? 
may inherit eternal life, may have eternal life by doing what? By keeping the commandments, by doing what is good, by doing uh, these things, by, by making this happen, by making that happen out of their own self-sufficiency. How narcissistic that this guy was and didn't even know it. How rooted and just embedded in self-sufficiency was this guy, okay? That's what I'm trying to share with you today is this self-sufficiency can run so deep in us and so, and so subtly that we buy into this. Because look at all that we've done. Look at all that we've done. And so he has, he has the backbone, the gumption. To come to Jesus to say, what must I do? Hey, Jesus, this isn't about you. This is about me. What must I do to inherit eternal life? I love how Jesus answers this. And it sounds really kind of off-putting at first, right? Because he basically says, you know, he basically says, you know, why are you asking me? Why are you asking me what is good? There's only one that's good, and that's God, right? And oh, by the way, if I, and I'm paraphrasing here, but this is what, where Jesus went with it. Hey, hey, rich young ruler, you already have the answer to your question. Keep the commandments, right? Keep the commandments. According to the commandments, according to the law, right? According, according to the Torah, this is what you have to do to, to inherit eternal life, okay? And Jesus spells it out for him. Don't murder. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. You know, don't do those things. Don't bear false witness. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. I find it very interesting that Jesus used those commandments to illustrate God's commandments, the law, right? Because if you truly think about it, those are ones, now think about it, those are ones that we can actually keep. I haven't murdered anybody, right? Have you murdered? Maybe some of you have murdered someone. Hopefully you haven't. But nevertheless, there is forgiveness and there is grace, right? But I'm just saying, those are the ones that can be very easy to keep. I haven't murdered anyone. I haven't slept with anybody. I haven't committed adultery. I haven't cheated on my wife. I, now again, um, I haven't stole anything. I haven't bore false witness or I honor my father and mother, right? But think about it. Have I truly not done those things? Remember us, you remember if you've been with us and tracking along with us for a little bit, when you look at the Beatitudes, when you look at the Sermon on the Mount, you remember Jesus kind of taking things to the next level? Because this is how we as a human view things. I haven't done these things. I haven't killed someone. I haven't committed adultery. I haven't stolen anything. I, haven't, I don't bear false witness, okay? I honor my, I've done these things. And Jesus in the Beatitudes on the Sermon on the Mount says, you know what? If you've talked a certain way out of anger, you've murdered someone. I wonder how many of us right now can truly say now that we've never murdered someone. I've murdered someone according to Jesus' definition. I've been so angry with my children. I've been so angry with my spouse. I've been angry with other people that I've said something. I've verbally assaulted them or I've verbally spewed toxic vomit on them. Jesus will look at that and say, you've murdered somebody. You see, we don't like to hear that. No, we don't like that aspect of it, right? Because now it takes us out of our camp because now we've just lost control. Now we've just been stripped of this self-sufficiency. And that's what Jesus said. I think it's very interesting, though, that Jesus lays out these commandments because technically just reading them from the technical perspective, just like the Pharisees did, and this guy would have had that same perspective, I haven't done those things. And that's what he tells Jesus. I can imagine him becoming very uh, prideful, or maybe ecstatic, maybe very happy to say, that's awesome, I haven't done those things, because that's exactly what he said. He said this, I have kept all these things. So, some translation says, I've kept all these things since my youth, from my youth. What do I still lack? And then Jesus probes even further, right? Jesus kind of leads, I think it's very interesting because Jesus brings them back, they enter in this discussion again, and Jesus says to him, he says, well, if you want to be perfect, if you want to be perfect, if you, want to, if, you, if you can do this, if it's up to you, if you really can attain this, if you want everlasting life, be perfect, okay? And he says, and he goes after the jugular, he, goes, he says this, go sell your belongings and give to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. And then in verse 22, a very sad passage, it says, When the young man heard that command, 
he went away grieving. Why? Because he had many possessions. Because Jesus got to the core of who he was. Jesus got to the core of what truly controlled him. Jesus got to the core of what this guy was truly about, right? Great, I've done all these things. What else do I need to do? Well, Jesus, go sell them. Go sell them. And oh, by the way, give them to the one that's in need. Give them to your brother in need. I find it very interesting because I think Jesus is saying here, oh, by the way, you've already violated them. You say that you haven't violated them, but you've already viola violated them, right? Because, think about this, guys. If we would read in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, and I'm going to paraphrase, but if you, want to, if you want to go there and take a look at that, this is what 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 says. How can you say that you love God who you haven't seen, but yet you can't love your brother who you have seen? Think about it. The first part of those commandments that we look at, you know, I find it very interesting, again, as I said, that Jesus kind of camped out on the second part of those commandments, the ones that dealt with horizontal relationships. But the first, the first side of those commandments deals with that vertical side of, of, of uh, our relationship with God, right? And those deal with don't have any other gods before me and, 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 and uh, honoring Him and loving Him, keeping the Sabbath and those types of things. But 1 John eloquently says that. You remember when Jesus was asked what's the most important commandment, what he said? Lo basically, love God, love others. Okay? Love God, love others. This would have been demonstrated, if this guy would have understood this, it would have been de demonstrated within his life. And that's what Jesus was saying. This over here, if you truly loved your brother, which you can see, you would be able to sell your possessions. Your possessions would not be considered guarded so tightly, but instead you would look at your possessions. You would be a good steward of your possessions. That speaks very loudly. That's a whole other message for us. But that was going at the heart of it. He already had violated his love for God because, you know, when Jesus talked about this, he couldn't even do what would really help the one that he loved or help the ones that he could see and show his love towards the ones that he could see. So how can you love God who you can't see, but you're not willing to love the ones that you can see? What a very powerful aspect that Jesus was going. You see, that was the disconnect. That was the disharmony. If you have, then what's up with the questions? If you've done these things, if you haven't violated any of these things, then what, where's the disharmony coming from? Why are you asking me these questions? You've already been giving these, you know, what, how to love God. You've already been giving these, uh, you know, how to, to have eternal, everlasting life, right? Keep all, the t keep all the commandments. You see, the problem is he couldn't do it just like you and I can't do it because it was rooted in self-sufficiency. What must I do? What must I do? Oh, great. I've kept all of these things. Well, are you sure you've kept all of these things? Are you sure you've accomplished all of these things? Or are you rooted in this sense of self-sufficiency as if you can keep all of these things? You know what's really interesting to me as well is, at first, at a cursory glance at this, it's almost as if Jesus is pointing to good works. Okay, then do these things, right? Do these things. Why didn't he say, why didn't Jesus say clear at the beginning, well, just trust me. Well, here's the beauty of it, guys. He likes to get us to think about things. He likes to get us to introspect. The problem is we don't like to introspect because a lot of times when we introspect, that's when we discover things about ourselves where we realize that we're off. That's when we realize that we don't really line up uh, uh, you know, in a way that God wants us to line up. And so, so for some of us, we don't like to be quiet. We don't like to be still and know that He's God. We don't like to reflect, truly reflect and introspect. We like to stay away from that aspect of our spiritual lives because that's when the Holy Spirit reveals to us things that, that's, that, that's off. Thing where there's disconnect, where there's disharmony between us and God, okay? That's what Jesus was doing. And Jesus was precisely saying to the guy, you, you need to trust completely in me. That's what he was getting the individual to try to see. That you know what? This isn't about you. This isn't about what you can accomplish. This is about what I'm going to accomplish and what I can give to you freely, right? This self-sufficiency is bankruptness. 
guys. If we root ourselves in self-sufficiency, it can literally bankrupt us, okay? There's no cutting it, okay? There's no cutting it in our lives, this self-sufficiency. That was the test. That was the test. Can you trust in me or are you going to trust in yourself? I wonder how many of us struggle with that question. That's a, I think that's a human rub that, that fleshly human rub that so often God, that through the Holy Spirit, through Jesus blazing His Spirit with inside of us, I think that is the rub because often He exposes that to us where we begin to trust in ourselves and we see a completely different picture and we don't like that. We don't like that at all. Jesus is saying basically what He said in Luke chapter 9. We've, been t we've talked about this numerous times. Deny your self. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross on a daily basis and do what? Follow me. You're not going to do it. It's not about you. This self-sufficiency thing is not about you. The question is, are, we, are you going to trust in me? It's not going to get you what you think. Deny the self. Deny self. Deny the ability to stop trusting in money. That's basically what he was telling this guy. Deny yourself. Deny yourself the ability to trust in these resources, to trust in money. But I want to say this. Money was the issue for this guy, for the rich young ruler. It was about money, okay? It was about him trusting in money. It may not be money for you. It may not be wealth for you. And let's face it, guys. Wealth is not the issue. Money is really not the issue. What is the issue? The love of money. That's what scriptures teach us. That could be another comfortable lie, right? It's about, it's not about being rich. It's not about having a lot of money, which we're going to see. It's not about that. What it's about is that we trust in that. We, the love for we have. But, so it may, it may not be money for me. It may be something else for me. It could be education for me. It could be possessions for me. It could be relationships for me. It could be something else. What about for you? Is it relationships for you? Is it about the right? Is it about the, the concept to be right? Is it about the concept that when you speak, your opinion has to be heard? Is it about you being popular? Is it about you having, having to have your way? Is that what it's about? Is it about humility where you just can't buy into humility, right? I mean, you, I don't know what it is for you. The, for, the, for this guy, the rich young ruler, it was about trusting in money. That's what he had. But money's not the issue. Sacrifice is what matters the most. And this is the key. Doing it yourself is impossible. You cannot do it yourself. Now, as I close, I want us to read on. Look in verse 23. It says this. Then Jesus says to his disciples, the guy leaves and he turns to, to his disciples and he says this, I assure you it would be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Okay, Jesus telling that to the disciples struck a chord. Okay, listen to what they said. When the disciples heard this, they were utterly astonished and they asked him, then who can be saved? How in the world can you be saved then? But Jesus looked at them and said this, and this is the key, guys. Listen to this. Verse 26. With men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Sounds like another verse we, that, that reminds me of another verse. How about Mary? Remember Mary? How is this going to be possible? Well, Mary, when it comes down to humans, it's not possible, right? But with God, all things are possible. If you're relying upon your own strengths, your own self-sufficiency, that God's going to help you if you help yourself, let me tell you something. This is a category where you're going to be bankrupt. And some of us struggle with that because it requires humility. It requires us to come to the end of ourselves and to say, Jesus, this isn't about me, but it's about you. This isn't about me, but it's all about you. Jesus told Peter that, or told the disciples that, when uh, the disciples asked, this is impossible, then who can be saved? You're right, it is impossible, because if it's up to you, 
you're not going to be able to save yourself. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and what? Follow me. That's what he told the rich young ruler. Sell everything you have. Love your neighbor and then love God. Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor who you can see. Sell that which has the very thing that has a hold of your heart. The very thing that makes you self-sufficient. Get rid of it. Let it go. Sacrifice it. Abraham, sacrifice that thing which you love the most. Your child Isaac. Let it go. Sacrifice. Let it go. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross on a daily basis and follow me. Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, then come follow me. Are you rooted in self? Is it about you? This is the beauty of it all, guys. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus is telling us, you can't do it, but I can. You can't do it, but I did. You can't do it, but I'm here to give you what? Grace. Don't worry. Don't worry about what you wear. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about your barns. Um, uh, you know, don't worry about those things. Whatever it is that's got a hold of you, don't worry about that. Let it go. Sacrifice it. Because there's nothing that you can do here but to deny yourself. To deny yourself. And respond to the free gift of grace and mercy. What a beautiful passage. What a beautiful story. It's sad in a sense. But God, but Jesus is saying, you know what? With, with man, with humans, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Follow Him. Give it up. Give it up. Let it go. And follow Him. And consequently, what are you going to have? You're going to have life. And life to the fullest. Guys, and, and again, you're going to have eternity. You're going to have salvation. But we can experience the kingdom. We can taste the kingdom right now. Jesus is saying you can taste it right now. Those of you that aren't following God, today's the day to respond to Him. And guys, those of us that are following God and we're still struggling with self, we're still struggling with self-sufficiency, Jesus is saying, let it go. Let it go. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me daily. And then, and only then, will you receive eternal life. You will be saved. You will have life to the fullest, right? If you know the truth, the truth will what? Will set you free. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for your free gift of grace and salvation, that it's not based upon us, it's not based upon our merits, it's not based on our hard work, it's not based on our self-sufficiency, but it's based on us losing our lives. As a Christian, that's what it means to lose ourselves, to give it up, to give it all away, to let it all go, and to follow you. God, give us the strength, give us the courage to receive your free gift of grace and love, to be renewed, to be refreshed, where some of us have been struggling and to let it go.